I'm, I'm not saying nothing. Uh, nothing more, because we're going to finish on a positive note, Lee. Okay? Yes, okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Nick. I've been watching Telling Well Stories with Liana Jones. And uh, I'm going to say, ta now. Did you say Liana Jones? I'm going to, I'm going to record that. in the Welshest surname ever. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Why do they most get... people are Jones, mate. That's why you just like most people are Jones. Mate, what am I on about? Well, I'm going to record that again. Yeah, do it again. This is the great <laughs> thing about editing. Fabulous, isn't it? We can work it in. We can work it in. <laughs> Yo, I'm Nick. This is Wales in the Movies, and welcome back to Telling Welsh Stories. And today I'm rather excited to be joined by Ms. Ms. Leanna Stewart. <laughs> Just Lee, that's all right. Lee's cool. <laughs> Lee, is it? All right. Yeah, that's good. I like that. I got this thing where I've got to like either shorten or lengthen anybody's name who I speak to. You know? I think it's just a Welsh thing in general, you know. <laughs> really? It, I it, think it, so. It annoys some people because it comes across as like over familiar, you know? Yeah, as a nation, I think we are definitely over familiar, over friendly. It's what I've discovered anyway. I obviously didn't know that was a thing until I moved. London. <laughs> I've never put that down to being a Welsh thing before, but I'm uh, more, <laughs> more happy to. Oh, lovely. Okay, yeah. So when you go to like uh, England, you can like that's your excuse for being really like touchy feely. Oh, Welsh is fine. Okay. Yeah, it's just nice. I think it's nice, isn't it? It's just being kind and thoughtful and just warm. I think, and that's a nice that there. Those are nice things to attribute to Welsh people. I think. Lovely, lovely. Uh, let's talk, right? Let's get straight on in. So I'm hoping that a lot of people watching this will know who you are, but I'm also assuming that some people won't. So let's talk about yourself. Um, so you're currently based back in Wales, or are you still in London? I'm not in Wales. Um, I'm in London, but I do have daffodils in shot just to prove that I am Welsh. Um, I should have got my flag, though, because you've got, like, you're representing hard there. You've got maps, flags, and everything. It's like, on my you know, yeah, it's like the equivalent of those men who are like badly endowed and they buy a big car. Like, I haven't got a Welsh accent, so I've got to make up for it with my paraphernalia. You do? Do I? I think you do, don't you? I, I don't know. I, I'd be noticed, I'd be told it's more West Country. Is it? Are you from the West Country? No, 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 no. Please <laughs> not. You um, sound Welsh to me, mate. She is. Well, update me later, the more we talk. And, but uh, yeah, I, I think I tried to make it more Cardiff when I got about 14, 15, because very middle class originally. But um, so I tried to inject some town into it. And oh, God, I do the same. Listen, like, I find this, the stronger the Welsh accent, the more I'm trying to, like, I'm not doing it on purpose, but I do find myself doing it just sort of like, dragging dragging the words a bit more and you know because I used to I, I feel like my accent is diluted a lot because I've been here like 11 years now in London um so sometimes people meet me and they don't know I'm Welsh and it makes me really sad yeah I get I get both I've had both across the world like oh definitely straight away oh you're from South Wales or Wales and then some people say what well, don't sound Welsh yeah no you do well, we're going to go on to accents later, but um, chance for you to banter. So, you grew up in Butte Town, right? Yeah. What? what? So, uh, when were you born? Do what were you asking? 1984, mate. Really? <laughs> like a book, yeah. 1984. Okay, scary. 1984, um, yeah. Right, so 84 in Butte Town. So, uh, just uh, going to ask you briefly about growing up around there. Um, how was it? Um, I mean, I loved it, you know, I, I had an incredible upbringing because it was just, I don't know, maybe it was just like the kind of late 80s, early 90s where you were free to kind of roam around and, you know, you'd be called back by your mum screaming down the street, Liana, you know, that sort of thing. But I loved it because we had things like the carnival, which was literally on my doorstep because I lived on Angelina Street. Um, which is right next to the field where they used to hold the carnival back back in the day. Um, and just having like friends and a community which represent lots of countries around the world. You know, I didn't realize how precious that is until I was older. But, 
you know, having all these multicultural fr friends from different backgrounds was, was incredible, really, you know, and, and, and something I know that a lot of people haven't, haven't had. So that real sense of community is something um, that I take pride in, and I know a lot of people from Butte Town take pride in too. It's, right, I tell you what, despite, like, I spent a lot of time in Grangetown as a kid, and, um, and particularly with, like, the Iranian, Persian, Grangetown community, but despite that, I never really learned about Tiger Bay until I got older and started to, like, research Wales and stuff. So it's amazing, really, that we don't have the stories of Tiger Bay in, in my school, for example. Like, yeah, we yeah. Had and um, have you seen the movie that's set down there? Like, it's an old one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know a few people who are in it. Really? Yeah, the really old one, the feature film, Tiger yeah, Bay. Yeah, 1959, right? Yeah, they had loads of extras from, from the docks. Gaynor Legal was in it. I'm pretty sure she's in it. And she's in your, your doc. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll go back and watch it, because I've watched it once. It's I've watched it once as well. Nice, but also it's, it's, it's some issues with it, aren't there? I'm sure we can talk about that later. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it really has nothing to do with the yeah. community <laughs> there. I didn't notice you said before that you wanted to make films about identity. Mm. Um, which is something I'm interested in. And uh, I'm going to ask you about the, your identities around there at the time growing up into teenage years. Which is the strongest, Black, Welsh or Cardiff? I mean, are they all in competition? Oh, all? that's a good question. Um, no, I think, like, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it, to the rest of Wales, Cardiff is kind of a bit like London, you know, like a bit... I've, I've had people call me posh in the valleys, which is <laughs> hilarious because obviously I'm not like, oh, she's posh from Cardiff. Oh, and it's yeah. like, what? <laughs> Tell me that again and put it in writing. It's tricky, or it was when, when I was growing up to identify as Welsh and be black, just because you didn't have that representation. Um, you know, it, it took me to leave Wales to, um, to have a, a real sense of pride, to be honest, you know it took me to, to leave to appreciate the country and the people, um, which, you know, happens to a lot of people, I, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a difficult thing, you know, you, you, it, and, it, and it all boils down to representation. Um, when I first learned about Tiger Bay, it's something I did feel very proud of because um, just the inclusivity of the place and the, the multicultural aspect of the place was something that we could point to as... Um, you know, to feel warm inside, inside about the nature of Cardiff and Cardiffians and so forth. Um, so, yeah, so your identity's boiled right down to, like, you know, Tiger Bay, then probably Angelina Street. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Interesting. There's just so much history there, you know, and, and I think that's what, um, that's what we love the most. And a lot of us who are from that very small area, you know, it's a very small area. <laughs> To have such a big reputation and, and we're all really proud of that. Brilliant. Um, so let's talk about your early filmmaking. So when are, you, when are your first thoughts of becoming a creator or filmmaker or whatever you wanted to be? Do you know what? I think aside from sort of wanting to be Whitney Houston and then realising I couldn't sing at a young age, um, I, I've always loved film. I've always loved watching movies so whether that was watching gangster movies when I was too young to watch them um, and when I say gangster movies I specifically mean sort of black American gangster movies menace to society boys in the hood that sort of thing New Jack City. Um, yeah New Jack City like those are the kind of films that I absolutely love and, and at the same time I would love animations Disney films so it's all about it boils down to storytelling and I've always loved telling stories I'd be the storyteller in a group of friends you know making stuff up and um, I just love that sort of thing so I've always wanted to be a storyteller um, but originally I wanted to be a dancer um, and then I came to London at 19 to study musical theatre realised I didn't really want to be a dancer and sing um, it was the acting that I loved and I, I just thought one of the directors who I admire the most is um, Spike Lee and I thought I could do what he did, you know, make the films and put myself in them because I, you know, even at a young age, I understood that to look like me and be in the movies, you had to go to the US or you had to make your own films because people are probably not going to cast me in them in the UK. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because I probably couldn't have, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to articulate that, but I knew that that was, 
I almost knew it wasn't going to be a possibility that um, I'd be given opportunities, so I had to make them. Anyway, long story short, I didn't get, I didn't get onto the acting course I wanted to at the Royal Welsh College. Um, and um, I went on clearing at Newport Film School, um, University of Wales, and, and got onto the documentary course there. And I thought, I'll just stay a year and then go back into acting. But um, I ended up enjoying it. <laughs> and then, you know... So it was a Coleon, yeah, which I obviously like I, I had no idea was the set of sex education. And I actually was watching sex education and I thought that looks really familiar, but I don't know why. And then I realized it was Coleon. Yeah. Um, so that's with uh, well, Chris Morris, Peter Watkins, Hughes. Yeah. A, yeah. So for people who are um, for, for the young ones who are maybe doing a film course or thinking of it or in the middle of one. I mean, some people say, oh, I don't need film school, and that's, and that's great. Some people say, I did. I kind of think the answer is somewhere in the middle for most people in it. So what did you get from studying documentary? What did you get from it that you took forward? I learned how to shoot. I learned how to edit to uh, a basic level um, and to produce and to direct. And we had this freedom for three years to make films. And I think that was really important. I went in not having any experience at all. I thought documentaries were really boring, actually. You know, I wanted to make fiction. Sure. Um, but I enjoy talking to people. So that's um, one of the key things in documentary, you know, um, is that you're a people person. Now, because of technology and the fact that you can put your own content online and build a following and then get interest from TV, it's a completely different time, I think, than when I came through. So I just think you weigh up the options. You know, you can save by a camera make your own films or you can go through through film school or university or a college course it really depends on the individual um because but I, you know you can learn a lot you can learn a lot i mean what i discovered was that there's, it's not just filmmaking is it if you want to be a like have the career that you're having you've got to have like fringe skills too like you've got to be able to sell yourself haven't you you've got to be able to have, be a bit of a business person too surely do you know what i think you need is um, you need to be determined. That's, that's the first thing. I would say that I only know of two p other people who work in TV from my course of around, I think it was around 20. And I'm one of them, do you know what I mean? And I, I think only two of us live in London. So I'm not saying you have to come here to make it, but it just gives you an indication. I think it's determination um, and, and uh, you need talent, of course, but determination will at least and, and, um, One word, persistence. What's that word? Uh, when you, you keep sort of at it, oh, my brain's not working this persistence. morning. Persistence, yeah. Like you, you need that, you really do. Otherwise you're not gonna make it, <laughs> you're just not. Do you go to uni or college or do you do it yourself? Just depends on, on who you are and whether you can stay motivated to do it alone or whether you can afford to go and study as well. You know, that can come as at an expense. So when you um, when you graduated, then did you have an idea of like any not a genre but any type of stories you wanted to tell? Like you said it before, you wanted to explore identity. I just wanted to do obstock. I wanted to do observational documentary um, because I like following people's stories. I like to see progression in someone, um, and I think you really get that with with obstocks. I, I thought I was going into an industry where I could sort of film someone or a group of people over a year or two years. It's just really unrealistic. <laughs> Not in TV anyway, you know, no one really gives you a budget for that. Um, but I just wanted to tell stories. I wanted to tell people stories. I love telling stories about marginalized groups or individuals, you know, um, so that's what I wanted to do. But, you know, I ended up doing factual entertainment. I ended up doing sort of, um those documentary series which are sort of formatted what would your class as your break your big break was it um jukebox i think yeah i think that was my big break and not in the sense that everyone got to know me in the industry because you know i was still very very junior but in the sense that i realized that i could direct you know i realized that i had something and that gave me confidence to move to london and and be a very persistent young person when I moved here, you know, I was extremely confident. Um, 
which is which is really interesting because you kind of everyone's like that when they're younger well a lot of people are like that when they're younger you know you have no fear right it's got a lovely energy to it hasn't it because of the music and the dancing it's got a, a natural inherent energy to the whole thing yeah i didn't know what i was doing do you know what i mean i didn't i didn't really know what i was doing um i just kind of thought this is what i should be doing yeah um good place to start uh, though, surely children's television is a great, great place to start for that yeah yeah it, it is but again i just didn't i didn't really have a clue about the industry or anything i just <laughs> it was my graduate film which ended up being 30 minutes and you know uh, liara barusi was just incredible and in giving me so much access and freedom to make that film so i'm really really grateful to jukebox for that um so do you like sometimes i hesitate to ask these questions so you know you would be because of so for people who are watching you made um, a BBC documentary just last summer called Black and Welsh. So I'll be honest, that brought me to your work because I'm generally not a TV viewer. To explore what it means to be black and Welsh. A documentary called Black and Welsh, obviously my ears prick up because that's for me a, a fascinating crossover of identities which I don't know a hell of a lot about, to be honest. I've got you know, ideas about it, but I haven't explored it too much. So what are your thoughts primarily on being a, a black filmmaker? And, and should I even be asking that question? Well, you know, I think eventually it just won't be, you, you won't have, I won't have that label. I'll just be, you know, a filmmaker or a director. But unfortunately, it, it, I, I believe we have those labels just because there's not many of us. Um, so it's very unequal <laughs> in that respect. Um, so, you know, I, I look at the end of the day, there's always got to be a few who are maybe who, there's always got to be a few who will be the first, right? So there's, there's always the first of a group of individuals who stand out um, just because you look a bit different or, you know, your gender's different or you look, you have a different skin tone um, or a different sexuality and you end up kind of being the poster person. Um, and it can be uncomfortable at times, I'm not going to lie, but, um, you know, I have to kind of do that in order to get more people who look like me um, at the forefront. And then, and then you don't get that label in the end, you know? So, um, so yeah, like I think Gaina says in your documentary, it's in not as important to be the first as to like, not be the last or the only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of my favourite lines because, I mean, she's an icon, but um, it is important, but it is also a struggle because you are kind of on your own, really. And but, you do represent everyone who looks like you, so it's like, oh, it's a burden sometimes. It's pressure. Like, it's quite heavy, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that responsibility, but um, do you think, in what ways, if at all, do you think that, the black identity and a Welsh may cross over. I think it's been a really good thing for me living in, in, in London, um, just because people, well, they're not going to forget I'm black, um, but they remember the black Welsh girl, right? Because a lot of people don't even know that we are in Wales. So it's like quite unusual, I guess. So I think it's a positive. Like I've I've only seen it as a positive thing, especially outside of Wales. I think when you're in Wales, um, it can be a struggle in regard to identity. But um, I think people are embracing that a lot, which is really nice at the moment. You know, um, giving us a lot of space to talk and fill up the space, which is good. Which is which I'm here for. Is there any, um, do you think there's a difference with your and your mum's generation? So your mum, Bonita, in your documentary talks about, she says, I never thought about colour in Tiger Bay when I was a kid. Um, but that was a different time. So is that the same for you? Um, or is it different for you? Um, I think when my mum was growing up, it was sort of like anyone with, who was kind of different stuck together. So if you were a person of colour, you were all under one umbrella. Do you know what I mean? You were a one, basically. Um, whereas, whereas now um, we're all kind of segregated. We all have our lanes, in a, in a sense. You know, you have black people here, then you have South Asians, then you have um, then you have Indians or 
uh, you could even separate Muslims and, you know, we, we all, we all take pride in that and stand for that and have these groups where we can have safe spaces. Right. Um, but what comes with that is that, um, you know, people then tend to kind of pigeonhole you into these groups. And if you're mixed race, where do you go? Like, you know, you, you're like, not sure I want to go here because my mom's Indian, but my dad's, my dad's black. And, you know, within the black community, it's not just black under one umbrella. You have black people from the Caribbean, black people from Africa, you know, black people from the US, you know, we, 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 are, we are quite different under the, under the black umbrella. So it's, it's, I think we've just got so many different identities that we've established now and that we're pushing. Whereas when my mum was younger, it was just everyone <laughs> was just together, just one, which is something quite nice about that as well, I think. I think it, in Wales, though, what, what I do see is that a lot of people from um, different communities who visually um, look, look different, um, or people of colour, let's just say people of colour, um, they, they maybe come together a bit more than, say, in the bigger cities like London, um, which is lovely, and you come under um you know the different ethnicities of wales right um and i think be it you know the community being smaller there maybe people stick together a bit more which is nice so let's talk about uh, your most recent film well the, the bbc documentary um so i might say some nice things about it okay and when i do that you know i'm telling the truth because i oh, okay that's fine i'm not going to be blowing smoke i can't stand doing that so um it's lovely isn't it <laughs> <laughs> what the film? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Did you not feel like a kind of a? It's got a lightness of touch, um, a lightness of touch with, like you know, and I I learned stuff while watching it, which is fabulous. Good. Um, like I learned stuff about the Somali communities, for example, and the two different generations of Somali communities, which which. I never, I never knew that stuff. So, um, and I never. Knew I didn't that. even know that. I, I, I didn't even know that. Sure. That's the beauty of it. You know, I, I was very much learning. And it's a great way to learn, isn't it? Making a documentary about something is a great way to learn about it. It's to, um, it's to make a story about it. Like I never heard of Gainer, for example, um, the girl. Never heard of her until, you know, and I should have done. So, um, oh I don't know about it, but it's got that lightness of touch, um, and, and energy and humour and. Everyone's so confident in it. Everyone's so confident in it, you know, and it's such a positive rep. Um, would you regard it as the biggest and most important thing that you've done? Yeah, definitely. That that is, it's it's interesting because I I felt I had such a massive responsibility to make it, but I also wanted to enjoy making it. Yeah. Um, I didn't want a film where we just spoke about racism. That was really important to me because. Um, you know, we can all talk about racism being black, you know, that, that's a thing we can definitely all talk about. But let's talk about the pride that we have of being black and being Welsh. And I just, I just love the voices that we had, the people who shared their stories, which was inc incredible. Like, I, I still can't believe I was that lucky to have so many really incredible contributors in this documentary. I feel really blessed for that. You're talking about voices, you know, and I'm watching it going, right, are we going to get a Gog in here? Are we going to get a North, North Welsh black? And I was like, waiting, waiting, waiting. And then, yes. And then there was, so you've got a North Welsh accent in there too, you know, which was, I found that very important. because. Oh, mate, we would have, we would have been in the shit if we didn't. And <laughs> to be fair, to be, to be honest, you know, it wasn't the easiest thing to do. Like, it just sure. wasn't it's so much easier to just for me as well coming from Cardiff to just rely on people from Cardiff and there were so many people who were great you know including people I know like friends of mine who would be brilliant but it wasn't about that it was about you know people being able to connect from all across Wales so yes. and, and her accent like oh my god I just had never heard anything like it Jackie really B. Jackie B. absolutely incredible I, I really I'm really grateful Really so good. I live in Bethesda. I'm really grateful for that. And, and all these moments, like, you know, just make you warm inside as a very pro-Wales person, interested in rap of Wales. So these moments are lovely. Um, so, yeah, you, the enjoyment is coming through in, in the film. And um, interesting stuff for me, Leroy Brito was talking about, the, like, almost like a fetishization. Mm. Like, uh, 
Now, I'm sure it's something I've probably done in the past myself. You know, um, not recently, but I'm sure when I was younger, I might have done you know, you know similar weird. things. And um, so I want to ask you a question. So one thing I aesthetically I love so much, not just aesthetically, but also the fact that it exists, is the distinguishable South Wales black accent. And I, do, I love the sound of it aesthetically, but I also just love the fact that it exists. I love the fact that if I'm, often I can hear a, South, a Cardiff or South Wales black person speaking, and I'll know they're black from their voice. And wow, that's amazing. <laughs> if you can identify that because you're in it so much, but I generally can. And, um, but I was wondering, is that, because Aldi, right? Aldi down the bay, down by Ferry Road, there's a woman in works in Aldi, and every time I walk in there, you can hear her. She's on the counter and she's bantering with everyone, right? Hilarious. And every time I walk in there, I can hear her straight away. And I was, about the fourth time I did it, I was, I was getting my stuff, you know, and I'd say to her, look, look, mate, you've got the best Cardiff black accent like, in the world. And, it, and she was like, what? What do you mean? I said, you, it, it's Cardiff black, the way you're speaking. It's just pure. Black, I have never in my life heard. Really? No, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of, I can't, I can usually tell if someone is black on the phone, whatever their accent in the UK, which is interesting. I think there's a lot of us who have that superpower. But I've never heard of a white guy saying um, a cat black accent. That is, that's really new to me. Maybe I'm imagining it, but... I mean, if you suspect it and it's, and it's true every time, then maybe you do have a superpower as well. You need to look at your heritage. Maybe you're... Oh, uh, bit, of, <laughs> bit of Greek, but uh, I think it's the autistic male gene. Like I love spotting accents. Like I'm obsessive about accents. So it's that. Yeah. It's that male autism. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> but, superpower. So, so my question was on a more serious note that that's not something you would find like in any way problematic. That that I can, that I love that accent and I want to hear it. It's not like a, it's not like a fetish thing. Like fetish in blackness. Um, I, no, I mean, I wouldn't think so. I think that's just you identifying the sound of a voice, which, um, which connects to someone who's black and from Cardiff. I don't know. I don't, I've, I've ne honestly never heard of that before. So well, it's, um, it's I wouldn't just, think so. It's not just Cardiff. So one of your contributors, uh, Alexandria Riley, um, yeah. The actress. Now she's from the port, right? So we want to represent the port. It's not all Cardiff. It's you know southeast. Yeah. Um, and something she, she said also hit home for me, which is a uh, talking of Cardiff Bay. Actually, just recently I've been watching and writing about um, Torchwood. You heard of that? Yeah, yeah. The kind of Doctor Who spin-off. The Doctor Who spin-off. Yeah. So the writer, you know, Russell T Davis, is a gay Welsh man, and mm -hmm. um, the representation of Wales and LGB. I don't think it's so much LGBT, but it's definitely LGBW. Um, it's something he talks about a lot. And he touches on something which I was going to ask you, which is that motivations for representing a group or a demographic or whatever. So and that, Alexandria touches on this in your doc, where she says that what I loved about her, what she loved about her character in the Tuckers was that it wasn't, a representation of a black person. It was just a black person representing a Welsh character. Yeah, it was a person. Just because, you know, so, and I think about this in relation to Wales, because this, that's my obsession, of course. So if you put a Welsh character in a story or if you tell a Welsh story, there can be like two reasons for that. There can be to explore the Welshness overtly, like to deconstruct mm. or whatever, or it can just exist because why not? Yeah. So, for example, a character can be black or Welsh or Somali or autistic or a woman or trans to explore that group or just for pure sake of representation. And um, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about that and the, the tension between them two in any of your work. The, the, prob the, the question is, why can't someone look like me and be Welsh, right? And it's because people will go, oh, yeah, but where's, where's your parents from? Why do I have to explain that when you're not going to do that to someone who has a tan? You're not going to go, oh, but wait, 
I want to be parents like Mediterranean. You're just going to instantly accept them as, as being Welsh. Yeah. I, I, think, I think we just have to stop doing this because at the end of the day, these are the facts. If someone is black and they are flying the flag for Wales, like Shirley Bassey, no one talks about her being a black singer. Nobody. She's Welsh, 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 Welsh. Do you know what I mean? Like no one goes, she's the best black Welsh singer in Wales. No, because she's up there because she's elite. So why does it have to take you to be elite before you could just be Welsh? That's my issue, you know, and that's where we are. You know, Alexandra Riley is a black actor. If she's getting an Oscar, she's not going to be a black. I mean, she's a black Welsh. Alexandra Riley is known as a black Welsh actor. Yeah. When she wins her Oscar, she's just going to be Welsh. No one is going to talk about her being black anymore. I can guarantee that. Why do we have to be so elite? Why do we have to be so extraordinary before we lose the, the colour label? Do you know what I mean? I understand that it's also there so we can have representation. So other people who look like us coming through can go, that's my icon. I can do it. I get that. But at what point do we lose it? And I think Shirley Bass is a, a brilliant example of that, which I've just come up with at this moment, which I never thought of before, you know? It shouldn't be separate. It shouldn't be, um, let's get... It, they sh you shouldn't question whether someone who looks Chinese or is Chinese of heritage and appearance, mm. who was born in Wales, who's playing a Welsh character, it's one and the same thing. It's not a separate thing. Telling a Welsh story doesn't mean that you have to have a white person. It just doesn't. It doesn't mean that. Of course, if you're telling a story about a certain family in a certain town where there's never been a minority, that totally makes sense. Like, you know, but if, if it can be anyone, any sex, any gender, any colour, it's fine. They're still just as Welsh, I think. Two more characters I want to talk about um, in, in Black and Welsh, which is on iPlayer, by the way. How long do these things stay on iPlayer for? I think like, it's on for a year, you know. A year, is it? Yeah. Go and watch it, people. It's 30 minutes and it's lovely. Um, so you, when you're making documentaries, I've done a couple myself when I was a student and whatever, and there's some moments when you're recording something and you're thinking, shit, this is gold, isn't it? Um, and got the two uh, twins, Venice and Monet, yeah. in your film, you must be recording them going like, this is going to be so good. No, no, no. Because that's our secret language. That's if you got to kill Russia, no? Because they're just, like, kind of natural performers, aren't they? Yeah, they're pretty confident little girls. And I've known them since they were born, you know. I've known their mother since we were three. Um, you know what? They, I, I, they were one of the first people I cast for Black and Welsh. And the reason was because they're incredible young people who are very proud of the way they look. And that's how their mother has brought them up. That's how their parents have brought them up. Um, so I wanted that sense of pride. And, and they're Welsh speakers. And I, I, that was another thing that was important to me, to have dark-skinned Welsh young people in this programme. Um, how did you go about casting it and getting the people? What was the process like? Um, it's a lot of conversations, a lot of asking people to recommend, which was great. So, you know, um, I just got on my Facebook. Originally, that was the first step and just asked people who they'd recommend to me. Um, and it was really important we got people outside of South Wales. I'm still gutted I didn't get anyone from Swansea, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I am gutted about that. So, but um, yeah, I, I am, I am, and the, and there are people there who we could have included in the documentary, and um, so I am gutted about that. But yeah. oh well. Um, so on that note, nice one. Wait, no, you want to talk about accents? I want to make sure you talk about you. You were going to talk about Sheldon and his accent. Sheldon, yes. Um, this was part of the question of, and thank you for pulling me up on it. Um, so Sheldon said something which interested me. Um, I don't know where I've seen him before. I definitely have seen him before. I don't know where. Um, yeah. Sheldon said something interesting to me about hiding his accent when he went to, to England, London? Uh, yeah, to London, yeah. Somewhere in Sloiga. Somewhere out of Wales. Somewhere in Mordor. And, uh, I, 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 actually, I did feel lost, if I'm honest. 
I was black, I was gay, I was poor. It was scary. And one way that I could fit in was to change my accent. <laughs> and he said, and he said he had to hide his accent to fit in. And I was just wondering, like, because there wasn't too much detail about that in the doc. Yeah. So what was the story there? And what accent did he have that he changed? Well, he just had a Cardiff accent, you know. Um, and when you are around very sort of, um, I don't know, generic English, kind of Southern English accent people, um, you stand out a lot. And I think he just stood out enough being a black man. Um, and then on top of that, you've got this accent, which you can change. You can't change the color of your skin, but you can change your accent. Um, so that's what he did, you know, and he's extremely well-spoken, um, but you can't detect a Welsh accent um, at all now after so long. And I can, I can totally understand, like, I, I did exactly the same. I didn't, I didn't actively try and change it. I just stopped saying certain things. I became aware of certain things which people would mock me for. So saying ta for example, I'd always say it all the time. Like, ta-da! Do you know what I mean? And and it was like a lot of the time early on when I moved, it was, oh, you sound like Silla Black or they'd start, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, and it'd be like, oh no. So I stopped saying it, but it, as soon as I meet a Welsh person or I'm in Wales, I start saying it again immediately. But while I'm here, I don't. I train myself not to do it. And it's awful <laughs> that I did that, you know. Um, and so yeah i can understand why he i can really understand why he did it and then i can also understand why he regrets it it's i've done it myself i mean i'm a complete chameleon like i'm very middle class so and my dad's a historian you know when i'm around that yeah yeah when i'm around that group like well i can feel myself speaking a bit more like this perhaps and uh but then when i'm around my mates i'm just pure cardiff and it, it does like it, they're both genuine identities but uh you know it's it's, it's normal. I think it's a pretty normal thing. But it's interesting with Sheldon because you've got the gay identity there too. Um, so you've got yeah. different on all them levels. Yeah. It's interesting though how he found he found that the accent was the thing that really uh, he, had, he felt he had to really change, you know. Um, but yeah, getting someone to admit that um, and then admit they regret it is, is a very special thing. You know, he was very open about that. And I'm, I'm really grateful that he did that because a lot of people will connect with him. But, you know, accents are, are fabulous. They're amazing things. <laughs> I, I, like I said, I, I wish I could have the accent that I had before I moved here. You know, I think I'm definitely not coming. Get it back. I'm so, much, I just need to, oh, my boyfriend just says you just need to be with your mum for a few days and it's, it's completely back. <laughs> safe um <laughs> so uh before i let you go is there any other topics you would like to cover or anything you would like to say to the no not really um just that i just love working in wales um it's one of my favorite places to work and make documentaries while people are incredible um i just want more representation of um of welsh people you know i i know we can be extremely funny <laughs> Um, but I don't want us to always be the laughing spots, you know what I mean? Like, laugh with us, not at us. <laughs> Take charge of the Welsh humour. Yeah, we are funny, you know, we're not boring and bland, <laughs> which is great. Um, but, you know, I just, I, and guess what? I only just, I only just watched Gavin and Stacey this year. I can't face it. I only just watched it. And, you know, I never, I, I only heard of Gavin and Stacey where someone said to me, um, when I first moved here, they said to me, what's occurring? And I was like, um, what? I was like, what, what? And they were like, you're Welsh, what's, what's occurring? And I went, okay, I've never heard anyone say that in my life. And they were like, yeah, they do. And I was like, listen, I'm from Cardiff. I've never heard anyone say it. And they were like, yeah, they do. They say it Gavin and Stacey. And that's how I found out about the series. And then I wouldn't watch it because of that. Because I just thought, why are they doing that to us? But then I have watched it. <laughs> And it is really good. Sure it is. It's really funny, but it's a lot of it's a lot of kind of laugh at us in it. Sure, sure. Ellie, I mean, that's why. Don't mind a little bit of that, but um 
And it, well, it's, it's a rare thing you've got actually uh, Southeast Wales people speaking like Southeast Wales people. So, like, yeah. you know, I mentioned Torchwood, for example, and, and you know, that shows did a lot for the representation of the area, but all the Welsh people in Doctor Who and Torchwood sound like they're from Tonopandy. Even yeah. they're from Cardiff. People from Cardiff speak like this. It's like, well, Cardiff is like this. It's yeah, and a little bit like that in Gavin and Stacey. You do yeah. have the you do have the accents where you're like they're not from Barry because you yeah. wouldn't sound like that from Barry. Um, but Ruth Jones but, did it just right, didn't she? Ah, oh, genius, absolute yeah. genius, and that's why I'm gutted that I didn't watch it because of her and her alone. She's incredible, really incredible person. Maybe one day I'll uh, I'll go there, but um, let's uh, let's see, shall we? But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you'll hate it. <laughs> you'll hate it. I'm, I'm not saying nothing. Uh, nothing more, because we're going to finish on a positive note, Lee. We're yes, to okay, yeah. Note. Yeah, so, so to finish on that high note, I'm Nick. This is Wales in the Movie. We've been watching Telling Mob Stories with Liana Stewart. Liana, what are you going to say? Ta-ra now? I'm going to say ta-ra, everyone, and thank you very much.